which is our last chapter, which is the buckling of column. We started the discussion there. You saw it on the board. It's for centric loading. We started driving the equation for centric loading. And then there is eccentric problem, which mathematically much more complex. Then none of this work for the design. Then we go to the empirical design. For the first time, you are realizing that whatever you are doing in the class is useless anyway. So therefore. <laughs> No, I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> it's the fundamentally, it is there. It's totally opposite. It is all useful. It's very good. But when it comes to the design, you have to make lots of modification. Everybody understand that. Because sometimes the result of the test, especially in the case of buckling, and the result of theory will not match because we don't know exactly, that's what we were discussing earlier, that this is discussing what phenomenon causes the buckling. Well, let's wait, we get there. Let's finish first the energy problem. So what, was, what did we do last time? Let's summarize those, those ideas. We, had, we have three type of uh, structure under loading. One was axial, yes or no? In the axial scenario, we had the energy of, we, in, the, in that type of problem, generally, we did not do, have to do the integration because the axial load generally is constant. Is that correct or not? Because with the type of problem we had, so I said most likely you have n squared L divided by 2 Ea. Is that correct or not? N being the internal axial force in the member, yes or no? And that is the total energy. Of course, this is where everything is constant. When everything, of course, is variable, we use the integration. And that was one homework or one handout that I gave you, that which was the conical shape. So you, some of you already have done that. I noticed that you come during the office hours, we discussed that. But that's the part of problem which everything is variable. Then we went to the bending. This is axial member. Then we went to case two, which was energy, total energy for bending. In bending, generally, M is always a function of X generally, not always. Generally is a function of x, so most likely, this is the most likely scenario, you have to integrate between 0 to L, L length of the beam, then it becomes m squared divided by 2 ei dx. So that was, the, these are the most common one. I'm putting all the common one. Parallel to this always is a constant, which becomes similar to that, m squared L divided by 2 e. Then, we had a total energy for case three, which was the torsion. For the torsion, again, see, this is the type of problem you, you got. So you have a torque T1 here. You have a fork torque T2 here. Everybody understand that. So there is an internal one is T, T1. Internal here is T1 plus T2, T2 et cetera, et cetera. But total energy here become T2L divided by 2G, because all I have to do calculate energy here and energy here and add it together, so in other words, there, were a, there was here a summation. I did one problem here, which was a truss, so I calculate the energy stored in each member of the truss and then add it together. Remember that? Then you have problem like that, because the truss is not one member. The trusses is, are having several members. All members are tension or compression. Remember that all the tension member and compression member have energy because energy doesn't recognize plus or minus. Everything is a square. Everybody understand that. However, this is the phenomenon. The trusses are not going to break because of sigma equal to P over A. The truss member is going to break because they are narrow and long. They are going to go through the buckling. Every member of the truss which is under compression is going to buckle before it's crush because they are long and narrow. We get that, we discuss it. Everybody understand that. So all of this will happening in future. Nevertheless, this was that. Then what was the result of Castigliano? You remember from Tuesday lecture. I hope you do. <laughs> so if I have a particular load and I take the derivative of that u with respect to that particular load, I will get that? Why? 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 Not why. So you say why, I don't say why. We get there. Therefore, if this is the case, if I do take the du with respect to dp1, notice p is the load. You see, you have here, I want you to understand what we are doing here. This, this is the member, 
this is P1, this is P2. This P1 and P2 are external. Internal load here is P1, here is what? And here is P1, and here P1 plus P2. That's the internal which goes here. That is the internal. Everybody understand that. But however, if I want displacement here, this is what it was. Because I have one displacement. A doesn't have any displacement. I have one displacement at B, and I have one displacement at C. If I take du with dp1, what am I calculating? This is what you call it u. I don't call it u. I call that delta, yes or no? Delta at point, look where p1 is. Delta at point c, that's right. However, if I take du with dp2 for this formula, this is the total energy. This is the u. If I take dp1 over the, du with dp1, I get delta c. If I get du with dp2, I get delta at b, because b also goes forward. Yes or no? Is that correct or not? However, this is what probably you had in your mind, which was correct. So I have here p1, and I have here p2. Again, this is now is the bending. Now, if I want to calculate the energy, is this one, yes or no? However, du with dp1 for this one, what does it give me? You see, it gives me displacement on there, p1, which is y. Is that correct? So for this problem, write it down. du, if I calculate du the way with the integration method, and they, uh, they take the derivative of du with respect to p1, so if this is point A, this is point B, this is point C, this is point D, e, I have calculated yb. Still, I cannot calculate theta b. Is that correct or not? Which I'm going to discuss it today. Everybody understood this one, yes or no? You can calculate yb or yc, correct? But the result was this. The derivative of the energy with respect to any load gives me displacement under that load, yes or no? Now, if somebody comes and asks me, calculate displacement under point E, what should I do? This is the part of lecture today now. This is what we left out at the end, the last lecture. So derivative of energy with respect to any load gives me displacement corresponding to that load, yes or no? Corresponding to that, this could be delta, could be y, or whatever force you have. At, in terms of torsion, you're calculating phi. Is that correct or not? Yes? Now, if I, this is the new now, the new material. If I do not have a load, this is the continuation of the castic linear onto and the procedure that you should follow. There are three rules. Rule number one, rule number two, and rule number three. All of them are cardinal rules, and if you do not follow it, you cannot finish the problem, or you cannot start the problem. Number one, what do I do if there is no load? In that case, we are going to introduce a fictitious load, or a, we call it a dummy load or fictitious load, because I need a load there, yes or no? I don't have it, who cares? If somebody asks me calculate why at this point, I put here a vertical load. If somebody asks me calculate theta at that load, I put a moment, Everybody, because it has to be corresponding. Let's do one of them at a time. So here, I'm going to introduce a dummy load Q, and I'll go through the process, Obviously, I ca calculate the du, the dq, is that correct or not? Yes? du, the dq become equal to y under the e, because that is the result of the Castigliano method. We just proved it last time. Is that correct or not? And then, af after my process is done, I let it go, to, q goes to back to zero. Is that correct or not? That is rule number one. Rule number two, which is obvious, so here, so simply put dummy load or fictitious load, load. All right. The second problem, which is very important, in terms of Q, of course, you put the Q, you take the derivative of Q. But let's back to this problem, which we had the load there, or that problem, doesn't make any difference. Let's say that I have here now a beam, and let's say that this load is 6 kilonewton, and that load is... 9 kilonewton, for example. That's the example I use for the other class. Doesn't matter. Okay. How can I take the derivative with respect to 6 kilonewton? I cannot do that. Everybody understand that. So what should I do? Call it P. That's right. So here is very important principle. 
the load in question, write it down, the load in question should be non-numeric. Okay, that's exactly, because I want that to remain as a variable, so I can, because six and nine and five and two and everything mixed together, is that correct or not? So I have to know that particular load. So if this is the case, and I'm interested, as I said earlier, to find the displacement under the P, I have to change that to a non-numeric force. In this case, will be P or a torque T or whatever. Is that correct or not? In order to be able to take the derivative with respect to P. Is that correct or not? However, this has been done. Most of people do that, but some people make this mistake. If P is 6 kilonewton changes to P, that P has effect on the reaction, yes or no? The reactions also must be in terms of P. It cannot be the number because P is P. I have to take a derivative. Everybody understand what I'm saying? That Please add to that. Okay, the load in question must be non-numeric or should be P or M or T or whatever, depends what you want to do. And not even that in the in bigger box in front of it, all the reaction also must be in terms of P, is that correct? Because P is going to affect your reaction, yes or no? Yeah. So in other words, if, let's say, if, if this originally six and five, I don't know what I did. If these are, depend on the length. If I put a six here and nine there, and this is, let's say, two meter, two meter, and two meter, I calculated for the other class, this become equal to eight, this become equal to seven. Is that correct or not? You can check that later on at, you, at home. Is that correct? This is all numeric, yes or no? However, if I change to P, I cannot keep this 8 and 7 because this P affects your part of this 8. 7 is dependent on P. Part of this A is. So what you do, also you make this like that because that 9, because 2 third, 1 third, it gives here 3 kips and 6 kips. This is 2 third. This becomes plus two-thirds of P, and this is plus one-third of P. You have to express your reaction in terms of P, P because otherwise your P disappears, you know, yes or no? <laughs> because when, see, this is the whole thing, derivative of six with respect to P is zero, but now the derivative of this with respect to P is two-thirds. Everybody understand what I'm saying That yes? So not even you have to change. This is obvious, of course. You have to go through the math of it. Not even you ch put the load in, in the letter form. You find all your reaction in terms of that letter form and then follow the rule. Is that understood? Yes or no? I'm going to do example. Yes? OK, rule three, which is the most important one. Rule three, so do this non-numeric including, if you want to make it very short, including all the reaction. That's right. Depends what kind of load you have. Sometimes they come into the picture, sometimes. Is that what you were going to ask? You know, I answered yeah. your question. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, let me finish because we have lots of work. Probably some of your questions I'm going to answer. Go ahead because well, I don't want to. We're doing all this to find deformation at B or at the middle or at E? No. This is, you see, what, why did I change this 6 kilonewton to P? Why did I change that? I'm back to question one. This is for deformation under P, all right? If this was, Q was here, so I don't want to come, Q is here, this can be six, and because I'm taking the derivative with respect to Q, that's got nothing to do with the P. Do you understand what I'm saying there? If, uh, repeat, there are three questions here into one. If the derivative, if the, you want to find it, we want to deformation at the middle of the beam. I want everybody to understand. You, because there was no load there, you have to introduce a dummy load and take the derivative with respect to Q. Of course, the Q is going to affect your reaction as well. So here you have going, actually, it's very interesting. So you ask that question. If you do that, how much was this originally? This originally, this was 8 and this was 7. Yes or no? If I add the Q, this becomes plus Q over 2, and this becomes plus Q over 2 because Q is at the middle. Yes or no? That has to be there, right? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Now this is one problem. The second problem was I introduced, because I'm just saying all of that so quickly, I want you to, because really this is something you can figure it out by yourself. It should not be the big deal. Now the question is, not that, the question is find the displacement under B. Then what should I do? 
I should put that six kilonewton in form of P, P, because otherwise I cannot take the derivative with respect to six means zero, yes or no? Mm -hmm. So I have to put this P, that can remain number or you can change it to something else is that if you want to, you can, do not have to call this one and half P if that's wrong, because you are taking derivative only with this one. Not every six kilonewton is a P, is that understood? Yes, this remains the P, this remains P2 or P3 or whatever it is, or nine, is that correct or not? Then you go through process, you will see what I do. Then you find this reaction also in terms of that and in terms of P as if P is not given, is that correct or not? Then you take the derivative, understood? Okay, now the third one, which is the most important, notice this is two process, one is the integration, after that is the derivative. But look at this, integration is over what? X, the derivative is with respect to load. They have no relation to that one. It is always mathematically much simpler, write it down. This is rule three, which is the most important rule. Always do the derivative before the deformation. Derivative before the deformation. All of that, I'm going to put it in example quickly, but I don't want to spend too much time now again explaining it again and again. To make it. When I do the example, you see all of this, one after another one. Is that correct or not? Yes? Okay, now what happened here? Now here write rule three, in the derivative before integration. Now what happened here, let's do for one of them. Let's say u is integral of zero to L, m squared, 2ei dx, yes or no? First, I have to integrate, take the derivative, but I do derivative first. So what I want to do, let's say derivative of du with dp. Look at that beam that I would get derivative of u with respect to p become equal to. Look, mathematically, it is much simpler. Zero to l, this become what? You know all, you know all your calculus properly. Do that become equal to what? 2m time what? Nothing? <laughs> Come on, guys. Dm with du, the p, is that correct or not? Yes? What's the u square? y square is always the derivative of y square is 2y times dy by dx. Yes or no? That's all I'm saying that. Of course you know that. Is that correct or not? Of course you know that. Yes? <laughs> all right. That is everybody knows that. Is that correct or not? Yes? Divided by? 2ei dx, notice now it becomes simpler. First of all, you do not have to square it because when you have a two term or three term, the squaring becomes nine term, yes or no? Now all you need to do is find m and its derivative. Everybody, two and two and drops out. They mathematically become one third, one fourth of what you were supposed to do with, you. not what I'm saying here, you can do the integration first derivative second, but if you do that, you have to do two pages extra math, which you would never get out of end of it. Is that correct? Especially if m is three term. If m is something like that, m is equal to minus px minus, I don't know, w times x minus two to the power of two. You want to square that and then take the derivative? Never do that. First take the derivative and then do the integration. The math become quite a bit low. Now, let's go to example. Did you get all three rules? One, introduction of dummy root. Second, non-numeric non to be, uh, you see, the number that, the load that you are taking derivative, you should put in non-numeric, and then do the derivation before the integration. And it is really, really simple if you follow these three rules. Now, let's look at the example. Here is the first example. So here is a beam. There is a load here, P. This is point A, this is point C, this is point B, it's L over two and L over two. Notice, again, going back to the discussion. If it is one load and one displacement, you can use work and energy. Remember, you have to understand everything. Where is Castigliano come? Castigliano comes into the picture, guys, for more than one load and one displacement. Actually, one, one load doesn't really make it that uh, one load as it doesn't define that. You see, it has to be one load, and displacement has to be under that load. Everybody understand that. 
However, like this problem, this is one load. If I ask you what is YB, YB is not under A. So I cannot use work and energy method. Yes or no? Because work and energy method was the displacement was under the load. Yes or no? You wrote it down last week at the beginning of the week. Yes or no? The, this, the, the work of energy method idea was that when you use it, you get the displacement under the load in the direction of the load. Yes or no? Correct? Here it is. Example, guys. This is example, very simple example. I need that this, because this beam is going down like that. Of course, superposition method, much simpler to use. This is just the idea. How, you, how do we use this technique for more complex problem? Yes or no? So what do I want to do? Why B? Do I have a B there? Do I have a load there no. to do? Because I have to take the derivative. So I have to introduce a dummy vertical load because it is YB. If it was theta B, I would introduce a moment. If it was a phi, it was a shaft, then I have to put a torque there to find a phi. Everybody understand that. All of that are in the table I gave you earlier. Depend corresponding relationship. Anyhow. Why B? This is the problem. As soon as you see there, you introduce there a Q. Correct or not? Yes? Now, as soon as you do that, now the problem changes. Now the bending moment from A to B is different from B to C. Although this is zero, but you don't care about that. You introduce the load. This, if there is a load there, this could go like this. Is that correct or not? Yes or no? There is two part. So this part, remember, uh, section, uh, chapter 9, or wherever we were talking about the beam. If there are two loads there, the, the section AB will be different from the section BC. So this problem has to be dealt in two parts, part AB and part BC. But this is what we do. We say U, this, I write this again for the first time. I'm not going to do it for second or third time because this is not necessary because it becomes a routine. Look, u become integral of 0 to L over 2 because we are doing for AB. I have to make here a cut 1. Everybody understand that. To find the moment from A to B, I call it M1 squared divided by 2EI dx. This is the energy stored. I hope you have done your homework. Many of you came to the office and you told me you did, but that's a good idea. You use this one in the first series of homework, yes or no, to find that. But that is for A to B. Then we have to do plus, now we have two chances. Go we'll either this way or continue with the same X and Y. For this problem, it's no sense to go this way because here you have a reaction and you have a moment, which is much more difficult, everybody. So let's continue. So this will be your X, is that correct or not? Yes? And then... Of course, that will give you cut two. We have done that in the past. You are aware of that. Of course, some of you missed it when the system become like that. But nevertheless, by now, you should know it. And since we are going from B to C, this will be from L over 2 to L. And it will be M2 squared divided by 2EI dx. Now, I have to write M1, put it here, square it, M2, put it here, square it, and take the integration. Then I take the derivative. But I said rule three, which I didn't put it here. Rule three was do the derivative before the, your math suddenly become half or one third, everybody. So do do that. This is what we are doing. That I said du, the dq is equal. You don't see it here, but M1 and M2 probably will be in terms of q and P, everybody understand that, but you are interested in Q now. Here, it, is that correct or not? Yes? So DU by DQ, which is what? Which is YB, is that correct or not? Is according to the Castigal linear theory, the derivative of U with respect to any load is displacement under that load. Expressment of that is Q is how much port B going down, yes or no? With no negative sign. Equal to what? Now look at that, that become zero, to L over 2, 2M1, two DM1 by DQ over e, 2EI DX plus integral of L over 2 to L. This becomes 2M2, two DM2 two by DQ DX divided by 2EI. The first advantage is obviously to see this 2 and this 2 is going to drop out. This 2 and this 2 is going to drop out, all you need is M and its 
derivative. And you put it in, because this becomes typical. Or every uh, This is typical. You see this? You put it in the box. You don't have to repeat it again and again and again. It's always. You need the m and its derivative when you are doing the derivation before the integration. See, I did my derivation. Yes or no? Correct? OK, let's see what is m1 now equal to. What's m1? You should have no problem with that one. What is m1 equal to? I put my hand here. This is the x. What's the m1 equal to? p times plus or minus? minus. Very good. So minus x. Correct? What's its derivative? What's dm1 with dq? There is no q. So look, this is the beauty of this method. Immediately, this gone to 0. Is that correct? I don't even need it. It does not have any effect there. Is that correct or not? Now let's go to M2, because M2 will be dependent on Q, yes or no? So write M2. M2 become equal to what? M2 become, now you are here. This is your X. P times, P times X, or minus PX, the same sign. Is that correct or not? Then Q times this distance, which is X minus what? X minus L over 2. So minus Q, because this, the action is positive. The reaction of the beam to it is negative. We went that several times. X minus L over 2. Is that correct or not? Now, what is dm2 by dq? This is how much? Zero. Zero. This become what? X minus, minus X minus L over 2. Because derivative of Q is 1, so I have to put the rest of it there. Is that correct or not? Yes? Correct? Now that I want to put it here, here, look, look. I need m1 and its derivative. This one become zero. zero. All I need is this, this one and that one. Now that my derivative is done, I have one more advantage right in the book. At this stage, I don't need q anymore because q value is zero. If I do any integral, if this becomes x minus l to the power of 2 over 2 afterward, the q is equal to zero. I did my derivative, didn't I? Then at this time, that goes to? Zero, because that's the, anything attached to it will go to zero too. This is bad. Is that correct or not? Yes? Doesn't matter. Qx becomes Qx squared over 2, but Q is zero, so the whole thing goes to zero. Is that correct or not? Yes? Because supposedly there was no Q there, right? So after the derivative, write it down in your notes. These are all the important. This is rule four, four if you want to add it to that one. Derivation, you are, or put it under three. Deform, derivation before the deformation, but after the, the, the derivation, let the Q go to zero because there is no use to keep it there because it would have no effect on your analysis. So therefore, that's it. So this is your, look how simple this becomes. This becomes integral of L over two to L. Moment, moment is minus Px times what? Times? This derivative, because this is gone. Everything attached to that is going to be 0. Times this, which is x minus L over 2 minus times minus become plus, which is very, very simple integration divided not by 2ei. Don't forget that, because with this operation, even we drop the 2, 2 and 2 drops out. Is that correct or not? Yes? So that's it. So equal to dx. Of course, you have a dx there. Don't forget that. That's the integral over the x equal to, you calculate that one, and the calculation ends up to be equal to, I put it somewhere here, um, if I can find it. Yes, it should be here somewhere. Okay. I want to give you the answer. Okay, the answer come out to be equal to 5 over 58, 5 over 48, PL cubic divided by EI. You see, this system was... We have seen it before. I hope you can see it from that corner. This is a large room, so hopefully you have 5 over 48 PL cubic divided by EI. OK, that's one problem that I used the dummy load. Now, the second problem also uses some of the material I just talked about it. It's very simple. Really, you don't need, technically, you should not need any help from now on because everything being explained, it's simple operation. The only thing that you have to worry about is writing m as a function of x that by now I'm hoping everybody is clear about that. Yes or no? 
However, that is the thing that you need to decide for your own whether you are clear about that or not. So here we are going to do this problem now. I did it for the other class. That's also, I think it's one of your homework. Not your homework, it's one of the question in the book. Maybe with different number, I don't know, I don't remember. I don't know when I wrote that down, but nevertheless, this is very good problem to do. This is six meter, this is three meter, and this is a force of eight kilonewton, and this is three kilonewton per meter. Two questions I want you to answer, though. Of course, as I said, this is a little bit lengthier problem. You need more than 10, 15 minutes to finish it. However, it's part of a deal, and we have to go through that. I want you to calculate, let's say this is point A, this is point B, and this is point C. I want you to calculate YC, and I want also you to calculate Tato C, two problem. Yes, or no? Okay, step one, what should I do? Now, everybody should not clear. Let's say you are finished there, you are going through your homework and you want to solve this problem. I need Y at C. So what do I need here? I need a, go ahead. Oh, I need, I was gonna say you need to make that a non-numerical. Of course, that's, that's the first point. Yes, you put that, you forget about eight, you put here, P. That was what I was saying. A couple of you had questions. Now I change it to P. The reaction at A and B will be, be dependent on the P and W. Yes or no? As you have done it many, many times. Yes? Those reactions must be in terms of P and W. But W is very simple. I don't have to make it numeric because that, I mean, non numeric because that's it there. I'm going to erase that. Forget about this first. What's the reaction here and here? This is so simple. Is that correct? What is that? This is three times six is 18. It's symmetrical, so it become nine and nine. nine. So this is, you have, this is the reaction due to the uniform load. Is that correct? Nine kilonewton and nine. Obviously, this P here going to push this side down and this going to go up, so you have to take the moment about here, a moment about here to find the reaction in terms of P. I, I'm not going to do that. Everybody can do that by taking a moment about here to find this one. Everybody understand, I'll take a moment here to find that one. But this will be the result. You will see that in a minute. Minus P over two, because P comes here. In actuality, that was eight. This would have been five. Everybody understand that. But look, it's not expressed in the five, because if this was eight, this would have been P over two will be equal to four. So this reaction would have been only equal to five. And the other reaction, of course, it has to be increased with three P over two because the sum of these two must be equal to that one. Is that correct or not? Yes? Correct? No, but nevertheless, it is not defined in the numeric. It defined in terms of? P. Now, everybody clear how what I did here. Is that correct? All the reaction you wrote in your note, all the reaction should be that this one does not matter here. Now, going to the derivation before the, so I need M1 and, now, is it to span? Yes. Span AB, the moment is parabola. Yes or no? The span BC, we, we don't have to discuss it even. It is a line. Is that correct? So it has to be, U has to be declared from A to B, different from B to C, yes or no? So that is the key, so you write as much as you want, but the, many of them are irrelevant. You can go to the bottom line, so U, A, B, plus U of, we don't want to go B, C. That we established last time. Instead of going B, C, which is very difficult, we go C, B. Is that correct or not? Yes, that's the what we established last time. From U of B, C, for this part, we go this way. In other words, for this part, we go that way. That's essential not to get into lots of math. That's what we said, yes or no? Okay, so the only question is, what is M1? See, the same formula applied. What is M1 and what is M2? So what I'm saying that du with d, see, you guess it for yourself. P is equal to integral of zero to, of, you are going from A to B, zero to, 6, M1, yes or no? I'm doing the, I already done the derivative. M1, dM1, what? The D, P divided by 1EI only, yes or no? 
yes, dx plus integral of what? Integral of zero to three. Very good. M2, whatever that is. I haven't established what M2 is. M2, I have to cut it here. Yes or no? I'll come from right. Is that correct or not? M2 and what? It's derivative. Notice this is not u. This is u. This is its derivative. I'm applying the derivative before the integration. Do you understand what I'm doing here? All of these are derivative before the integration. Yes or no? Correct? So dm2 over dp divided by ei again because 2 and 2 drop to dx. So all we need here, m1 and its derivative, m2 and its as usual. This is a beam. This is something you have to do. By now, we have made this clear because see how many weeks we went through this to show you how to calculate m as a function of x. Now, can you tell me if I make a cut here and this distance x, what is m1 equal to quickly? Of course, m1 is ra times x. Is that correct or not? What's my ra now? ra is 9 minus, very good, 9 minus p over 2 times x positive. Look, the action is negative. The reaction is positive. Then I have this continuous load, which we'll know what the effect of that. The effect of that is a parabola, yes or no? Minus w x square over 2. We have done that so many times. You should remember it, yes or no? Or you can make a cut. At this stage, we have done this so many times that I'm expecting none of you draw a free body Dagger. Remember I said do it the first time, do it the second time, do it the way back when we were in chapter 7 or 8 or 9. Everybody understand? By now, everybody should clear because the action of this one is positive. The reaction is negative minus W. What's the W? 3, right? X squared over 2. No problem there. Yes or no? Yes. I just want to make sure. So on the final, if we don't draw the free binary, are we going to be okay still? Yeah, okay. as long as it's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. See, I expect that much from you guys, because many of you do it that. But there are still a one or two or three people. I don't know. I hope not. But there are still some people who do not make a mistake between internal and external sign. Fortunately, if it's consistent mistake in the sign, will not affect your result because it's square. So you change the sign, all of them. But if one is plus, one is minus, it's supposed not to be, then you are, you are in trouble. You will never get the right answer. Is that understood? So the, for example, if you make a mistake here, you put this plus and the, you put this minus and this plus has no effect on your answer because you're changing, in other words, your sign convention. However, if you put this plus and plus, that's impossible because this action is reverse of that action. Yes or no? So it cannot be. Is that correct or not? Of course, we can do Now, what's the derivative of that? This is the, what derivative of tp, what, dm1 with dp equal to. First of all, derivative of this is 0. The derivative of that is what, 9 times x has no derivative. 0 minus p over 2x. What's the derivative of that? Minus x over 2. Everybody with me? 9x has no derivative minus px over 2 has the because derivative with respect to p, so it becomes minus x over 2. Is that correct or not? And this one, 0. So that's it. That's done. M2 is what? M2, we are going this way. So we are going this way. Is that correct or not? Yes. So it is p times x, plus or minus? Minus. Ne minus. Very good. So minus px. And its derivative, dm2 by dp, actually is minus x. I hope everybody is clear to that. So all we have to do here, write it down again one more time, 0 to 6. Now, here is the point. Now I don't need to keep this any p anymore. Actually, it's much simpler to put now because my derivative is done. Yes or no? Now, what's this number equal to? 4. Because p was 8. Yes or no? 8 divided by 2 is 4. For 9 minus 4 is? Five, is that correct or not? Yes? So it is 5x. This is 8 now, after the derivative. Because I could not put 8 there because I could not take the derivative. Everybody understand that. Now that the derivative is done, I do not need the q. I do not need the p. In the p case, I've changed it to number. In the q case, I've changed it to 0. Is that understood? Yes or no? So it become what? It become 
9 minus 8 over 2, so the result is 5. Yes or no? 5x minus 3x squared over 2 times minus x over 2 dx divided by ei. Correct or not? Yes? And then for the second part, we went from 0 to 3. Correct? And the, this was minus 8x because p is x, minus 8x times minus x dx, many times minus and minus drops out, become plus, because that's the energy is always plus, by the way. Is that correct or not? Yes. If you get it negative, there is something wrong, so remember that. So therefore, here it is. All it, the rest is simple integration. This, this becomes 5 over 2x squared. This becomes x3, integral of x2, etc. cetera, et cetera. The rest, you have to do it. Hold on, so let me finish that one. When you finish it, this becomes 135 divided by EI, which is a positive number. Yes? I think you dropped the P. I've done with P. P, I didn't drop it. I put the value of 8. Originally, P was equal to 8. P was 8. Yeah, but why are you dropping it in M1 but not in M2? Well, I dropped the F2 too. I did, I changed that. Why should I drop it? The value of P is 8. I don't understand. Why aren't you keeping it in M1 though? What? Why aren't you keeping it in M1? Yeah. Originally it was there. That's because you know why, <laughs> Mr. Nazarian? Because when I was discussing this, you were not here. That's the problem. We discussed that. P is there. P is... That's where we were a little bit late today for whatever reason. So P is, I said, when there is a P here, we cannot have new value. We do the P, yes or no? We do the derivation. When the derivation is done, now what's the value of P? What, was, what did I put there? Look at your original, what P was equal to? Eight. So I put eight there. I didn't eliminate that. Again, this is 9 minus p over 2. I did not. I put here 8, the same thing here. If that's what you mistake. This is, I put 8 and 8. That's what I did. I did not. Because p has a value. q is 0. If this was a q scenario, I had a q at this point, then I let q goes to 0. Because the q is a fictitious load. It's not supposed to be there. Is that correct? But here, I had a load of value of 8. It's obvious. I put it 8. That's it. For every question. That's what the intention was. That's what we did. I think you think about it, it you will see it. Yeah. Yes. Was that the EI the denominator? Oh, this one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, of course. Yes, sir. Correct? Now, the next question. Everybody understand. The next question is this. I'm not going to do that part because the rest is very simple. This part is very simple. But what you need to do the next is calculating what? Calculating. Now, here you have to answer, Mr. Nazario. Now, again, go back to what I said earlier. Now, if I want to calculate theta at that point, I don't have an m at that point because theta is related to the m. Corresponding value with the deformation and the load is m. Therefore, I have to introduce there a moment as a fictitious moment. So I put here. M, and I'll call it MQ if you want. Some people call it Q, but remember, that is a moment. Is that correct or not? Yes? Because I want trying to calculate it, but the value of MQ should go to zero. That's right. So now here is the case. Now again, I do not need to keep this P, remember. If you want to do two problems at the same time, so you keep the P, you keep Q, but this is more math. Everybody understand what I'm saying. But I would rather you not to do it and do. But this one is already eight kilonewton, yes or no? Because now the question is, this one should be non-numeric. I don't care about the rest, that's what I'm saying. That You can keep everything in any form you want as long as it makes it easier for you. So I don't have to write it like that. that actually, this becomes five, and the other one, I don't know, whatever we had there before. Everybody understand what I'm saying, that yes? This become five, and the other one become 21, because you have to add that to it. So now that's the effect of this and that one. But the M effect of MQ is not there. But if you did this correctly, you have to take the moment. The effect of MQ will come into your 
reaction as well. Everybody understand that. This is the net result. Take the moment about here, bring MQ into the system. This become minus MQ, MQ over 6, 6 being the length here, L. So if this was given in terms of L, this would have been MQ over L, which is the right unit, because M is a moment divided by the length, become a force. Is that correct or not? Everybody understand what I'm saying? It's something that I see right away and you don't see sometimes. If I write there 5 plus 3 MQ, would you buy that as the correct answer? If 3 doesn't have a unit, is that do you buy it? No, because M is the unit of M is what? Force distance. What's the unit of 5? Is force. This is supposed to be a reaction. This must be divided somehow by L. And as you see here, MQ over 6, this 6, of course, is the L. Everybody understand that. Nevertheless, that's part of a static, and I'm sure you can do it. Question, yes? Is it supposed to be over 9, or is it between the... No, I have not finished this. That become, let me, M, that become uh, 5 minus MQ over 6, and this become 21 plus uh, MQ over 6, because this and this should be cancel each other. Two together, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't finished. I was just going to five point. Yes, is that what your question? Yeah. Good. Of course, it has to balance out. Notice now this and this drops out and then because one because this load pushes this one down and this is part equal and opposite. So one become negative, one become positive. You have this you will have to practice it through the static. Nevertheless, now again you have to write M1 and derivative with respect to Q. M2 and derivative with respect to Q, and then let Q go to yeah. zero before the integration, and you can solve it. You can do that at home if you want to calculate theta C. I'm not, but the most important thing is this one, because some of you have a little problem there. The rest of it is writing M and taking the derivative with respect to Q. Q. So what is that I'm saying at the end, du, the dQ, is equal to theta c. Agreed or not? Yes, but it will be done in two parts, a, b, and not b, c, c, b, because we are coming from the other side. Is that correct? But the answer, you want to check it at home, theta c become equal to 57. But instead of that, I would suggest that you do your homework. This is the more appropriate to get to the idea of what you are doing. Is that correct or not? Yes? OK, everybody? Right, OK. What is left next? I don't want to miss anything from the other class. What is left next is the last favor is my, your subject and my subject. What are those? We are talking about the beam. What do I missing here? Indeterminate. What? Indeterminate. That's very good. Let's look at the indeterminate problem. These are where all determined. Would this apply to indeterminate problem? Perfectly. Actually, one of the good ones for this method. So therefore, let's see how that works. OK, I have a couple of problems here, but I did one of them for the other class. I can change it, or no, I can use the other one, so because this is simple, but this is quickly, we can go there. So here it is. Remember, we have a cantilever beam. This is the beam. And we put a uniform load there, W. Probably I did this. With the first problem that I did for the double integration method, I did it again for the superposition method. Now I'm doing the same problem with the energy method. This is, of course, is a determinate problem, yes or no? Because I have only one fixed support, one fixed support is sufficient. Is that correct or not? However, as soon as I put here a roller support, I have too many unknown now. Is that correct? This, you have seen it in the past, become? Very simple, in, but indeterminate problem means with the static alone, I cannot find a reaction. Is that correct or not? OK, what's the solution? Come on, guys. It is only two lines, but what's the solution? Do you remember what we did in superposition, better guy? What did we do? If this was supposed to be done with superposition, which I did it in class for you, what did I do? Yes, by move it, what did I put there? If this is point A and this is point B, what did I put there? I put, uh, there is a reaction there because you're putting a support there, therefore there is a reaction. So that reaction is RB. Yes? Okay. Look there. 
What's the, what is, what's the derivative of u with respect to Rb? What's the derivative of u with respect to any load? Let's put it this way. Put your, your mind at ease. I'll direct you there, you know, all of you. What's the derivative of u with respect to any load? It's displacement under that load, yes or no? What's the derivative of u with respect to Rb? Zero, because y at b is zero. Yes, so how many times do you use that for super? You see, this is the same again and again and again. <laughs> I don't have to mention it. You know it. Is that correct? I want, hope to, you understand. The only reason this becomes indeterminate because you keep this point from going up and down. Remember in a static, the way I was teaching a static, I said, guys, don't remember arrow here, arrow there, moment. When you restrict emotion, you create a reaction, yes or no? Remember those of guys who take a static with me? Remember how many times I mentioned that? You restricting emotion. This way, you cre cre create a reaction. That you restricting me from going down to the second floor. You're putting a reaction under my shoes, yes or no? So if you're ro ro restricting the rotation, that's M, M. Is that correct or not? What did you restrict here? You restrict this from going? So it gives you one unknown, but it gives you one extra boundary condition, which is y equal to? Use it. Use it. You used it in a singularity method. You use it in superposition method. Now you are using it in energy. Or, and this is not force. This is Castiglia. This Castig that's the second theory of, of Castiglia. You want to be clear about that when you go to higher courses. Therefore, du, write it down, du, the drb must be equal to? Zero. Even if you have a little settlement there, you want to bring that into the system, you can. Because then you can bring it that equal to 0.1 inch or 1 millimeter. Everybody understand what I'm saying that, yes? But in this case, if this is not going anywhere, the U with DRB must be equal to zero, which become one equation for one unknown. If you have two unknown, you take twice. You see, because if there is another load here, D U by D R B and D U by D R C is that correct or not? There become two equations and two unknown. Ten equations, who cares? This goes on and as long as you write a computer program to do it, that's what I was telling to the other class. This leads to a technique that in future you can formulate everything and write a program. And your, if your program is the best program in the world, then you suddenly overnight you become a millionaire or billionaire or whatever. Is that correct? The fastest you get this done and requested that people can use it, okay, that's a product. Is that correct or not? Yes? And not think about it. All the singularity method and this method and other method later on in future classes or in advanced classes when you go to graduate school, it becomes a technique that you have to follow and come up with a overall solution. And that's what this is just the first and second step to it. Is that correct or not? You can do a lot now with this. For the other problem, for example, if the beam was like that, remember that beam? I forgot to mention that. You have this as part of your, this could be going like that and like that. You see, you can incorporate EI because EI of AB is different from EI of BC, but you can be incorporated in that. Or you can make a beam going like that as a mechanical engineer. You design a beam that suddenly decided to strengthen the middle part of a beam because the middle of the beam has more deflection. You want to prevent that, yes or no? You can use this method. The other method doesn't work, but you have to change it between A to B to B, C to C, because the EI changes. That's the only thing. Everybody understand that. Then all sort of thing. You have learned it in future. All of that will come into the picture. Nevertheless, so let's do that one. Now, obviously, I'm not going to go from here. I am going to go that way. Yes or no, right? Yeah. And cut it at distance x. And that m become equal to rb times x minus wx squared over 2. Yes or no? I don't have to go slow on that one because I need 15 minutes for the balance of the lecture. Is that correct or not? Yes? Then what do I need? I need the, the derivative of that m with respect to rb. Yes or no? Remember, you need m and its derivative always. Yes or no? Because the, this is the bottom line. I'm, I'm not going to mention that. This u is 0 to l you are going from b to a. And then it will be m squared do 2EI dx, but in this when you take the derivative, du with drb, I don't have to repeat that. You want to repeat it for your homework once or twice, you are welcome to do it. But after that, it's the routine. Everybody understand that. du with drb become equal to what? Become 
integral of 0 to L, M, DM by DRB, yes or no, divided by EI because 2 and 2 drops out. Is that correct or not? So as I said, you need M and its. So therefore, this is M and its derivative. DRB, oh, sorry, DM by DRB is equal to, only equal to X. Is that correct or not? That's X and this is 0. That's it. So then your DU by DRB become equal to integral of 0 to L. You put the EI here. Then you have RB. Of course, RB is not 0 here. RB has a value, RBx minus Wx squared over 2 multiplied by what? Multiplied by x, its derivative, no 2, dx, which is very, very simple integration. So you integrate that. The answer comes out to be equal to r equal to rb equal to 3, 8, WL. As soon as you find, you see, this is the whole thing. As you, you find out RB equal to 3, 8, then you can use your equation equilibrium to find RA and, notice, this W is not half here, half there. It's still, there were one or two students when I gave this problem during the quiz, but that was three, four weeks ago that made that mistake. Don't bore of that. They put half a load here, half a load there. Is that correct or not? Do you see what happened there? The load on the right-hand side is 3,8WR. The load on the right-hand side, if I remove that, will be what? 5,8 of WL. And then based on there, you will have an M there. Is that correct or not? That's M. That's it. I don't have that one, but you can calculate that. The rest of it is equation, uh, equation of equilibrium. All right, and then you do other thing. I mentioned that I have one more minute, so I'll, I'll do that too. So there are other problems that you have to do. If it is the torque problem, it's very simple because the torque is added and added like it. But if it is an axial moment, it could be a truss. So remember the trusses I gave you, remember that? Yes? Yeah, yeah like that. Now let's say this is sitting like that. Let's say there is a load here like that, P only, correct? If I do this system, the one I did last time for you, I was calculating this is point A, this is point B, this is point C, this is point B. I calculated how much B was going down, yes or no, with work and energy method, yes or no. However, somebody comes and tells me how much point B going to the right, what should I do? Dummy load, is that correct? Because I have to, you see, this is the whole thing. The work and energy, I'm repeating this for you to understand. It's very simple. Work and energy gives you the displacement under the load in the direction of the load. Yes or no? D did you underline those words when you wrote it down? So apply it. That's all. Read it, understand what you have written down. Yes or no? So what is the load? Load is at point B. How much point B is gone? How much this point eventually is going to go down? Is that correct or not? That's the only thing you can measure with work and energy, which you have to find the energy stored in this one, this one, this one, this one, and that one, which I did one example with three members for you. Yes or no? Then the question is for more than one load, which is the Castigliano. Yes? So as soon as somebody asks how much point B goes to the right, I don't have a load going that way. Yes or no? But then what should I do? I should introduce a dummy load Q. Is that correct or not? Now, of course, the member will be dependent on the P and on the Q. So I find the energy in each one. This is addition. This is not integration. It is like that. See, this one is the addition. So you do that. Then you say 2N DN by DQ. Is that correct or not? Yes? Look. The derivative of that with respect to Q is 2N DN by DQ. 2 and 2 drops up without the integration. So it's simpler. So that's what I didn't do. I did the one that is more difficult, the one that you are scared. Is that correct or not? The other one is axial member. All you have to do, add them together. But don't forget, this member, there could be some zero member. I don't know. This member and this member and this member and this member, all of them are axial member and their energy has to be added together. So the sum is between all five members. Is that correct? And all five members, this is the point. If this is eight, again, eight kips or kilonewton and this Q is not given, you find every force in terms of Q and the 
number is that correct so one become two kilonewton plus half a p everybody half a q etc etc and then you take the derivative you let q go to zero is that correct or not very simple operation you don't need to know that okay let's go to the next one next chapter so that kind of question is all in your homework so there are in detail couple of indeterminate problem as well everything is being explained thoroughly so you should be able to do it now let's we have a, a week and 15 minutes or 20 minutes to go through the last chapter, which is chapter 10, which is the problem here as well. Now, if I don't have this, this is about displacement. If you want to solve this, some of the members are in tension, some of the members are in? Compression. That's what I said earlier. The member in compression, they are not going to break because you're crushing in them because they are long. They are five feet long, 10 feet long, and they are very narrow. Most likely, they are going to? Buckle. So many of your problem in future, actually buckling is one of the major issues in every design. That everything that you design, even the, the, the window, that middle part could buckle. Everybody understand that. Now, the, what's the buckling? That's what we want to investigate and understand what's going on. Everybody understand what's the buckling and what's the, so you need to go to the next page, take a deep breath because you are going to face lots of math now here. <laughs> I asked you to study your differential equation. equation. How many of you did it? One, zero, minus one. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. That's typical. I don't expect you with so many work to do. But that's funny because I say it, but nobody has time or energy to do it, to go look at it. But probably you know the answer. If you know the answer, you are okay. But if not, we'll find out. <laughs> okay. Now, what happened here is this guy. So you have, a, we call it column. Of course, when we say column, as soon as we say column, that means it is, you see, it could be pin-pin connection, and then you put a load, it must be compressive load. Is that correct or not? So the member under tension, they are not going to buckle. The member under compression, they are going to buckle, and that is load P. Is that correct or not? Yes? All right, what happened here that in theory, if P is applied at the centroid of this cross section of this column, sigma must be equal to what? Minus P over A, yes or no? And this is sigma applied. And nothing else should happen regardless of the length of this column. Doesn't matter whether this is three inches long or 300 inches long, sigma always equal to P over A. That's what we learned from previous chapter. That's lecture one, ME 218. Sigma equal to either tension or compression of P over A. But that's not what's going to happen here. In a minute, we'll find out how or when, what happened. Then, of course, we have a sigma yield. And as long as our sigma applied is less than sigma yield, we said our design is safe. Is that correct or not? And the difference between the two gives you your factor of safety. So therefore, you have a factor of safety of sigma yield over sigma applied. And many times we ask that about the P yield, P that causes yield divided by P applied. And we use either one of them because sigma after all is equal to P over A. This is P over A. A and A drops out. Yes or no? So you're expecting that no matter how long this is, I apply the load here and I have a cross section here. Let's say I put the cross section to a square inch. I keep increasing the load. The column is going to crush. But of course, you know that's not the case. By experience, you have found out that if you have a long and very narrow rod, as soon as you put a little load on it, you are going to have a that's not the bending. That's what I want you to correct that. The, what you see is there is no bending. Where should the bending? The load is at the centroid of column. If you see a large and huge deformation, which is not like this deformation. See, this deformation are minute. It's, it's very small. You see it's the order of, you don't see it with eye. You come to the room, the beam, the form, the column. Do you see this building going up and down? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you come in. Actually, the tall building, by the way, you don't see that. The high rises in New York, when the wind blows, they go about one foot or one and a half foot on top. <laughs> but it is relative floor to floor, you don't see it. But from zero to up there, it goes without you realize. That's how they've been designed, because it is too tall. Everybody understand it. But relative of one floor respect to the other floor is very small. It's in the order of less than 
couple of millimeters. Is that understood, what I'm saying? That means they are very small. But here is what we are talking suddenly, without any notice, sudden. Actually, bending is gradual. If this was by bending, you put 10 pounds, it bends a little bit. 20 pounds, the bending become twice. Everybody understand that? They become, this is a sudden and unrecognizable phenomenon, which we call it buckling. This is probably the answer it is, because system goes from stable to unstable. It is stable, stable, stable. When this sigma reaches, with the P reaches to one certain point, which we call it sigma critical, which we want to find out how much that is, at this point, suddenly the item is going to get like this. Everybody, which is not a bending, it is a Buckling, of course, any item like that should break. Is that correct at that point? Or use the serviceability of that system. Is that correct or not? So that's the buckle. So you can practice that. So what, how much it is, is this phenomenon, which I explained for other class, or might as well, I thought it's a funny story behind it as well. So that is what we said. Let's, let's look at the stable and unstable scenario. Have, uh, all of you have tried to put two uh, tennis ball on top of a I don't know, basketball. Have you tried to do that? Unless you find some scratch area, you cannot do that. In other words, you cannot put a marble on top of a marble. Yes or no? However, technically you should. Which was the question they asked me during that. I said it to the other class. Do you think during my dissertation, when I was going through my dissertation, nine professors were sitting there, the big shots, all in the room, and they called me to come in. And they asked me to study this. A sphere on top of a stair. The top one was full of? water and they wanted to me draw this and then explain that to them and is this stable or not stable of course this was my first question in my dissertation of looking at those all guys my hand went like this the right 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 to the <laughs> circle and dr Fluri, i remember that specifically which was the big shot then he came out and raised his hand he said he cannot draw a circle so i said <laughs> <laughs> So you know now why my more circuit is so bad. Everybody, <laughs> I had it there, still I have it there. <laughs> Anyhow, the story is this. I remember this because the funny story. Eventually, I did good enough to pass it. Anyhow, so you know what you know. Don't. <coughs> Nevertheless, that was the story. What I'm saying that this phenomenon, a circuit over a circuit, is unstable. Why? As soon as, this is how you have to prove it, I have to prove it for them. As soon as you go a little bit distant, this changes the weight. You see, there is a theta movement, then this drops out rather than go back. So we call it unstable. Is that correct or not? Because this is unstable, you can never put that. Smallest angle movement, epsilon, drops this down. Is that correct or not? However, if you have this scenario and you move this ball or this marble a little bit up, it goes back. So this is a stable, this is that. So when the P is less than P critical, the column is stable. When P reaches to P critical, suddenly go from a stable to honest. And we want to find out where that is. Is that correct or not? Everybody understand what we want to do? Yes? It's a little bit more advanced than what you have before, but we can get it done. So let's drive the equation, and then we do the rest of it next week. So hopefully we go through example and everything, look what happened. Now here is the B, first of all. I'm going to call this distance, I mean this axis. Why? I'm going to call this axis X. As you see, if I turn this around, I want you to understand that. If I turn this around, this looks like a beam, yes or no? Correct? So the equation of beam applies. The only difference is, instead of having a vertical load, I have a axial load, but we are not investigating the bending of this item. We are investigating the buckling of this, this, this thing. Is that correct or not? No, not what happened there. So that's the one. So theoretically, this is what we are going to get. This is point A, let's, or let's call it this. This is point A, or let's call it something else because this will get mixed with the other. So let's call it this X and Y, that's, that's okay. Let's call this one point O. So when you draw the, you cut it here, and you give the beam a little deformation. This is, I gave the beam, uh, or a column in this case. I deform it like that, and which I gave it some y, because this is the y action, because if it goes like that, notice I have a y there, and this is y, this direction is y. So I give it that y, and I put my load there, p. Obviously, in this cross-section, I have some internal 
action as usual. Yes or no? I will have, of course, a force of P equal and opposite. Yes or no? Yeah. Of course, this is a couple. Yes or no? I should have here a moment. We have had that in many beams before. So I should have here an M as well. Yes or no? But what's the value of M now here? Be careful what you are answering. What's the value of M? Look, P times what? P times Y, not X. For the first time, you're seeing something totally different. So the value of M actually is minus PY because this action is going that way. The reaction should be going that way, the way I draw it that way. So the answer should be opposite to that. Is that correct? Which I'm calling it minus PY. Yes or no? So that's your moment. That's the axial load. Then since this is a beam, look at it. This is the beam. And I want to investigate whether this happened or not. This is large and unpredictable deformation. I want to calculate that. I draw, write the equation of the beam, which was EI d to y over dx squared. Remember that from two chapters ago, two, three chapters ago? Equal to what? Equal to moment, yes? Mm -hmm. But moment equal to what? Moment equal to now? Before, moment was a function of x. Now it is a function of y. y. Something totally different. That's why it is so complex. P <coughs> times y. Or by differential equation become EI y double prime plus PY equal to zero because I bring this to the right because this is y double prime and this is y. And then I write <coughs> y double prime plus lambda square y equal to zero, which is like where I choose. See, I divide this by EI, both sides. So where, write it down. Lambda square or lambda is equal to a square root of P over EI. So in other words, what I did, I divided this by EI, and I call this e, P over EI lambda square. Is that correct? Is that right for the simplicity, right? Correct? Yeah. So my differential equation, guys, give me another five minutes because I have to finish this. We don't want to go back here. We want to start the example. Look what happened there. It takes about a few minutes, but please bear with me. So our differential equation now looks, again, one more time, y double prime plus lambda square y equal. In the book, they use some different parameter. They use, I don't know, something new or something, but that's OK. I use lambda square because I'm used to it. Is that correct or not? Yes? This is our differential. What's the difference between this differential equation and the one we had in the beam, the one we did in the beam, this was on this side, and all was function of x. This is no function of x. This is a function that if I found it, its function and its second derivative should be the same. What function is that? What? P? E. E, e. e to the power of x, yes. Or sine and? Because sine and cosine actually can be expressed in the power of except, uh, yeah, exponential e to the power of x, e to the power minus. Everybody knows that. Is that correct? So the answer to this is totally different from the other answer to that. And it does not have a, it has a general solution. It does not have a particular solution because this side is zero. Is that correct or not? When we go to eccentric loading, the other side will appear. But let's, let's doubt at this time. So to write it down, the solution to that one is a sine of lambda x plus b cosine lambda x. If I, when I write it down, you probably recall this solution from your differential equation class. Yes, yes or no? Yes? Correct? <laughs> Correct. That's what I said. Yes. OK. I accept that. All right. However, if I don't have time here, I did it for the other class. All you have to do, take the first derivative, which become a lambda cosine minus a lambda sine. Second derivative become a lambda square sine cosine, but it become all the same as you. So you add it together, it become equal to 0. Because after second derivative, it become exactly like the First, uh, first y plus a lambda in front of it, so 0 becomes equal to 0. So believe it from me, this is the solution. Yes or no? Don't put it aside your note. This is the best part of it. <laughs> we haven't done that. <laughs> Finish the problem. Now, I have, this is the boundary condition, A and B. Or you can call it C1 and C2. I believe in the book, call it C1 and C2, too, but I call it A, B, and B because I want this to be different from your beam solution. Is that correct or not? A and B replaces C1 and 
C2, those are the boundary condition. What boundary condition do I have? Remember, this is pin and this is pin. Yeah. Look at the way I draw it. Is that correct? Or not? So at x equal to 0, y equal to? Yeah. At x equal to L, y equal to? Yeah. The same boundary condition as the beam. So let's use it, see what we get. At x equal to 0, y equal to 0, 0 become equal to sine of 0 is 0, plus b cosine of 0 is 1. Therefore, b cannot be any number except 0. So b must be equal to 0. So therefore, this one is gone. Correct? Based on my boundary, I change my boundary condition, that may reappear if everybody understands what I'm saying. That for this boundary condition, which is pin pin, is that correct or not? Now, the next boundary condition is what? At x equal to L, y equal to 0. In that case, because this is gone, now 0 becomes equal to A times sine of lambda L, because I have to put x equal to L. Now, this is my solution, still left. This is my result of my boundary condition. Now I have two options here. In order this to be 0, what can we go to 0? One is A goes to 0. Yes or no? If I set A equal to 0, I have no solution because A is 0, B is 0, Y is 0 means this co column is stable. Yes or no? But there is a possibility that A has a value. Let's say A has 5 or 10 or 100. I don't care because, as I said, this is an unrecognizable phenomenon. A can get any number, and this can be satisfied, and this can be satisfied, A being non-zero. In order A non-zero, what should be zero? Sign of lambda L. That's right. If sign of lambda L is zero, which is really where this problem becomes going from stable to unstable because my my uh, differential equation has a solution. Boundary condition is satisfied. A is non-recognizable number. It could be very huge. It suddenly can go to a huge deformation. Everybody understand because A is not defined. But sine of lambda L must be equal to 0. What's the value of lambda L? What's lambda L equal to what? Lambda L equal to, again, 0 which gives me, again, everything 0 like before, no problem. Or lambda L, next one, become equal to pi. Yes or no? Lambda L become equal to pi, and 2 pi, and 3 pi, all of these are the answer. We call this mode of the buckling, or mode of the vibration. Some of you guys would take the vibration before you take a wire, like a violin. Take it here, let it go. You will see that. Sometimes it goes like that which is first mode, yes or no? Sometimes you have seen wire doing this, yes or no? That it is the second mode, and this is third mode, etc. But our column, when it goes to the first mode, it's going to break, yes or no? I never get it to the second mode and the third mode. So lambda L must be equal to pi, which gives us the following equation. So you square both sides of it, and then lambda L, Lambda square was equal to what? Lambda square was equal to P over? Yeah. But now the P is P critical, because that's where I have the solution, a large deformation. So I put here P critical over EI, which is the value of lambda L, multiplied by L square equal to pi square, which gives us the following formula. P critical equal to P is pi square EI over L square. This is called Euler formula, or Euler. This is very important to recognize this. From now on, in any engineering field, you open your mouth and you say Euler formula, they know you are going to talk about the buckling. Everybody on the buckling. Is that correct? Now, what is this? Look, very important. Look what the peak critical is dependent on. Is that, if this happened before the crushing, everybody under depends on the L. Everybody understand. It. So if E is large, means what? Means the material is, is not a plastic. It is still. It takes more load. Is that correct? <laughs> is the I is large? What does it mean? The cross section has a larger I. It has. Got, yes, that correct. And then reversely, if it's effective with L. So if, if I take it one foot of material, I may crush it. Two feet, I may crush it. Goes to three feet or six feet or nine feet, it never crushes. It buckles before the 
That even is reversely, it is with L, it is L square. Everybody understand that. So if I have a two feet column and it buckles under certain load, if I make it four foot, this become one fourth of that. Everybody has suddenly to the point that if you have a 10 foot column with this much cross section, you cannot put even, you put one pound of it, it's going to buckle. Many pipe, very long pipe under buckling, under their own weight, they buckle. Everybody understand, you can break it easily. No, that's the fact. Is that correct? Many items that you saw there, the blade of all engine and everything that you are designing, the body of your car, you have seen it. Anytime you get a bump, your body of car is not going to cry, it's going to buckle. You see, you get a hit like that, suddenly you see this. Have you seen that? Because it's so narrow in thickness. So therefore, everything buckles. So you have to go. We go through the example next time. So that's the Euler formula. That's the P critical. We have to see our P that we are applying is less than that or over that. If it is less than that, then it is crushing. It's more than that. It's buckling. Yes. Yeah.